Hello, everybody. I'm Anthony Gonzalez, and I'm the Senior Program Coordinator for the Higher Education Center. And I want to welcome you all today to our webinar titled Introduction to Prevention, Considering Comprehensive Approaches, featuring our very own Dr. Jim Lang. Before we get started with today's uh, session, I do just have a couple of housekeeping slides I'd like to share with everybody. Here on the screen should look somewhat familiar as we are in the Zoom webinar format. We do welcome your questions at any time throughout the live session for our presenters. We do just ask uh, that you direct your questions to the Q&A. We do have the chat enabled, so feel free to introduce yourself, share where you're joining us from, along with any resources and reflections on the presented content. But we do just kindly ask that you utilize the Q&A feature for those specific questions. Uh, it's just a little bit easier for us to keep track of. Additionally, we have captioning enabled for today's session. You should be able to turn that on through your bottom dashboard if you have any trouble getting that set up, feel free to send me a message and I will uh, try my best to help you through that process. We also encourage everybody to learn more about becoming a member of the Higher Education Center. You can learn more about the different membership tiers and the benefits that go along with them by visiting our website at hecaod.osu.edu. We also have a few upcoming events that I'd like to share with everybody. We have a water cooler chat take, taking place next week on August 13th, and we'll be focusing on opioid, opioid overdose on campus. And we will also have a recovery focused webinar taking place September 26th and is titled Ethics and the Collegiate Recovery Professional. So we hope to see you at both of these events. Of course, you can learn more about each of them by visiting our website. And with that, it is my great pleasure to turn it over to uh, our executive director and our presenter today, Dr. Jim Lang. Thank you, Anthony. Let me uh, queue up my slides. All right, hopefully you can see them. Um, and I'm, I'm really happy to be able to uh, have this discussion uh, around um, sort of an introduction to prevention on a college campus. Um, and one of the things that um, I think a lot of us are interested in is having a comprehensive program. So if you're new to this and you wanna start thinking about what to do um, on a college campus around alcohol and other drug issues, um, thinking of it uh, ex um, from a comprehensive or expansive approach um, makes sense. But that said, um, comprehensive, is a, um, a big word, but also um, somewhat vague in terms of what do you really mean by comprehensive. And so in the process of this introduction, I'm going to be um, talking about different types of comprehensive um, tasks that you could take uh, within the programming and the policies and um, the activities that you are doing on the college campus. Um, so there we go. Um, so some of these different types of comprehensive uh, may follow in sort of categories. And so we're gonna talk about them um, in different ways. Some of it, it could be programmatic. I think a lot of people think of it as in programmatic aspects, um, trying to uh, reach lots of different um, folks or in right, lots of different issues. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but you can also expand it into um, thinking about, well, what's, what are the influences um, and being comprehensive in that regard. Um, and then we can also think about the individual and, and where they're at and where they're on a continuum uh, of either misuse or a continuum of change. And then um, some of the strategic processes and being uh, comprehensive. So we'll dive in to some of these uh, components and hopefully in that way, we'll touch on many of the issues that um, you'll in, in encounter uh, as um, the people doing the work on the college campuses. So let's start with um, something that I like to call uh, uh, sort of a functional um, uh, approach uh, to uh, comprehensive programming. And when we um, when we think about that, we're thinking about well, what are the elements that have to happen um, to uh, successfully prevent uh, alcohol 
and other drug misuse. Uh, and this is a, a diagram that I, I developed a long time ago because I think it kind of encapsulate, encapsulates the, um, the different approaches. So you can think of this as um, uh, something really simple, uh, like a physical um, thing that you want to prevent. So let's say there's a ball rolling towards a target and you want to prevent it from hitting um, that target. There's really only three ways um, that you can successfully do that in a simple universe. Um, one is to um, put a barrier between the, the ball and the target. Um, so when the ball hits that barrier, it, it's um, inertia is absorbed and it doesn't move anymore and it stops and it doesn't uh, hit the target. That is similar to the um, types of um, programs that we do that put barriers to use. Um, so you could think of um, having policies around um, whether or not alcohol is permitted on campus or in certain environments. Um, it also works within the enforcement um, aspect, making sure that people actually do not have access or feel that they might get in trouble if they um, try to have access to certain substances. That's um, a, an approach where you're putting up barriers um, and uh, affecting access. Another um, way you could do this is instead of a uh, barrier, you could divert. So you could put something that diverts the um, ball from hitting the target, but it continues to move. Um, and that would be very similar to the behavioral alternatives um, that campuses may um, employ. In, in this sense, what we're understanding is that there are certain motivations, certain um, needs, certain developmentally appropriate behaviors um, that college students um, will want to, um, to do. And we want to put them in a place where it isn't going to involve alcohol and other drugs. So these are like your alternative programs, your late night programs. Uh, could be uh, something other than that. It could be like dry parties or you know, whatever it is that you're you're thinking of. But it's but it's recognizing that there's motivation and developmental needs of our students, and we want to um, move them into spaces where they can actually achieve um, those goals, um, but not um, with uh, misuse of alcohol and other drugs. So. Those two are um, some of the core uh, components. But then there's also another way you can um, stop that ball from hitting the target. You can either put in a repellent um, or remove an attractive force. Um, and that could um, also mean that you don't um, have that ball hit the target. And that motivation and that um, sort of energy that too, um, that target is another component of our prevention. Um, so motivational focus, sometimes it's called individual focus or, or you start thinking about, well, what is it um, that is attractive? Uh, why are people using um, or misusing uh, substances? And, um, and somehow change that motivation. So it could be a motivation to not use, it could be a motivation to use less, or it could be, um, you know, any, any of these components, it could be um, that you recognize the repellent, like the things that um, college students might want to avoid, um, the consequences, the, the um, issues that may come with use. Um, so that's a repellent uh, force, but that ha happens in the, in the individual. They have to internalize that and have their motivation changed if those elements are in place. So these are the three main ways that we can change um, alcohol misuse uh, on a college campus on either a population level or an individual level, these core approaches. It doesn't really tell you what to do, but it tells you the function that you would be trying to achieve through the um, activities that you're doing. Now, this 
this diagram includes a couple other um, circles because there are elements of support or the opposite of that um, that come from the community. So um, if you're trying to limit access, um, working with the community is going to be a really important component of um, this because the community community can either support or inhibit um, access. Um, same is true for uh, alternative activities. Um, are there things for people to do in the community um, or are the community members actually uh, facilitating um, some of the misuse? And also uh, within um, the motivational focus, understanding those sort of attractive and repellent um, uh, forces might be um, generated from community and the community can help with that. Um, Notice that the, the research component that is wrapped around doesn't actually touch, but one of the things that um, you know you, you we're going to talk about is uh, how research informs how to do some of this work. Um, so this particular diagram doesn't actually tell you exactly what to do, um, but I have found this to be very helpful um, to talk with people who are um, maybe on campus or in other um, settings um, to have them understand why we need to have a breadth of activities. We can't just do one or two things um, because really aligning our activities um, and assuring that we have these different types of interventions can be really helpful. Now, another uh, approach to um, thinking about the uh, comprehensive component is really the, um, the influence. Where does the influence come from um, and the decisions come from? And thinking more broadly than just that individual, but the individual, their beliefs and their attitudes and what they know and, um, and what they're able to do is very important and we can focus on that. But that's not the only influences that the individual has. It's not all internal. They are, of course, affected by um, the, their interpersonal relationships, their friends, their um, clubs, their um, uh, family, um, all of those um, folks that they end up interacting with can influence what their individual decisions are going to be. Similarly, you can move out into the socio-ecological model of behavior and um, look at the institution. And, and if you've seen this model before, recognize that um, there's many versions of this particular model that have different levels or, or onion skins or whatever you think of this as, um, but it just is a, a model. So it helps us expand where we're thinking and become more um, uh, comprehensive in what we think is influencing the individual. And the institution, of course, has a, has a, a large role in that. Are there sales or advertising uh, happening on campus? Are there clubs that are sanctioned to allow for certain things? Um, all of those kind of pieces, the, the policies on the campus, um, the, the norms of the campus, um, can impact the individual. And so if you're trying to do the prevention work, understanding that some of the influences coming from these different levels is, is really important. Uh, the community, just as it was in the last um, slide, uh, also uh, facilitates or inhibits um, the activities that we're trying to address. And so um, understanding that those have influence as well and then at the very broader level, and, and really public policy and society can be thought of in, in some of these levels. Um, it could be your community you know, has public policy and um, is part of the society, but it can go um, even bigger than that. Um, and so understanding that some things we can easily change, some things may take a lot of effort um, to make different public policies, um, changing uh, the understanding of the society around certain types of behaviors. But that doesn't mean it hasn't happened. It does happen. And sometimes that's some of the most wide ranging impacts that you can get is if you can be at these really wide um, levels of influence. 
We can also think about uh, comprehensive as uh, comprehensive along the continuum of care, uh, understanding that there's a range of different um, places people are and trying to reach um, and appropriately address the issues that different people um, will resonate to and actually need. Uh, so there's this, this particular version of this model, um, again, recognizes um, that continuum of care, uh, which really understands that people are in different places. So, um, and if we think just broadly, your whole um, campus population, um, things that you wanna do, it could be um, you're doing some promotion. You're just taking um, a stab without understanding where people are, but understanding that you might be able to do something useful um, to really a wide range of, um, of students. Um, and that can also fit within the universal um, types of programs you might do. Um, things that will impact the entire population, whether or not they currently are um, uh, maybe experiencing some sort of um, use or misuse. Uh, that could be some of the policy work um, that you do, that it impacts um, everyone. And, um, but then you could start moving to, you might wanna start addressing particular um, types of um, students. Students who uh, perhaps are uh, already understood to be at risk. Um, so a lot of campuses find that their um, uh, fraternities and sororities are uh, uh, populations where there is um, heavier use of alcohol and other drugs. Um, and actually um, heavier uh, or more prevalent um, sort of consequences to the community or themselves. Um, and so targeting some of the programs to um, not just promotion and universal, but start looking at um, those who are um, selective or even indicated. Um, and that's where you might see, uh, for instance, in indicated care, um, you might see someone who has gotten into trouble um, and um, and then goes uh, to perhaps have a basics program um, intervention or something like that. Uh, but then you can also recognize that you have students that are um, moving along this continuum and actually um, probably need more of a treatment type of um, intervention. And so this particular model um, allows for an understanding of where people are on this continuum of care, or continuum of use or misuse. And, um, and so this is, again, another comprehensive approach is looking at the population in this type of way. I don't think usually people think of um, uh, this particular aspect, a uh, continuum of change, but I think it's really important that we understand um, that students are not just on a continuum of use, they're also in a continuum of um, wanting of change. Everyone can improve. Some people really don't need to think about a lot of improvement. They may not be using at all. They may be using in ways that really aren't gonna be problematic, um, but uh, that doesn't mean that they can learn more, uh, they can't learn more, and um, it doesn't mean that they can't support more. And you can think of students um, in this um, continuum of change uh, as well. And so this particular model, I like this, this, this image from one of the very early uh, days of um, the uh, stage of change model. Uh, I'll just like the little swirlies. Uh, but if you look at it, it's, it's, a, it's swirling up in this particular model uh, where you're looking at whether or not someone is um, pre-contemplative, they're not thinking of changing. There's no um, uh, thought about it. Um, and, and what we've learned from this particular model is that um, people have different reactions to information based on the place they are in, in this continuum of change. So if someone is pre-contemplative, they're really not in a place where they can hear um, ideas about change um, because it's not, it's not relevant 
to their state of mind. Um, but this particular model has people uh, going from uh, pre-contemplative to a place of contemplation where uh, they are thinking about um, the issues at hand. And um, that could be a place where conversation could be more targeted, um, especially if they've moved to preparation and action um, where they are ready to start trying some things um, to uh, improve um, their outcomes. And it could mean not using it all. It could be changing the way they use. It could be whatever it is. But it, it talks about um, this continuum of where people are on change. And so um, there's, there's lots of folks who talk about motivational interviewing and motivational enhancement. And I think those are really important components to how you move people to different places of change. So that's where you are focusing on that motivation, um, not necessarily the use, it's the motivation that you're trying to address. And so understanding where you need to address motivation um, and understanding that continuum and then being comprehensive. Where are they on this continuum? And then another type of uh, model uh, isn't as much about um, the change. It's really about how to do it in a way that um, covers all the bases so that you, the programs that you want to do have the best chance of succeeding. So this is a little bit of a cheat. It's not quite the same as the types of uh, comprehensive that I've talked about, but it's a really important component of the work that we do is um, being strategic and being um, comprehensive and thorough in what it means to be um, strategic. And so this particular model, and, and there's um, links here, um, to, a, to a whole uh, manual, and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in some future slides, is, is important. Even if you don't follow it to a T, it's important that you understand, well, you're going to need certain steps to successfully do the work on campus. Um, and that's going to be, you're going to need to have an assessment. You're going to have to understand where things are. If you don't know where you are, how do you make goals? to understand uh, where you wanna be. And then if you've done that work, you wanna see whether or not you are making the change so that you actually see that you're doing the improvement. So that assessment, the capacity building, is what, what can you do? Um, understanding your capacity, seeing if you need to build it, understanding whether or not um, maybe it's something you don't have the capacity to do. And so you're not choosing um, interventions or programs that make sense. Um, then do that planning, uh, figuring out you know, from that capacity to the planning part, doing the work, having the implementation occur. But then, very importantly, um, evaluate and then assess it again. And this is a circle. And this um, will lead you to a better understanding of what you need to do, better understanding of what you're doing is, is something to the level that you think will actually make the change, uh, getting the feedback from that uh, approach, and then um, continuing because there's always a need for improvement. There's always going to be new things on, on the horizon. Um, within this model to make the, the flower uh, more complete. Um, understanding that sustainability is also a very important component. Um, and cultural humility um, is also a really important component. Um, understanding that as you're pulling things together, you, you need to make sure that your program isn't uh, a one-off or isn't um, exacerbating um, discrepancies um, in outcomes. And, um, and that's the sort of work that this particular um, strategic process can help you with so that you are thinking about all of the elements that you need to do to accomplish the goals that you have. And then finally, and we're gonna dive into this a little bit um, page by page in a minute, um, a comprehensive uh, approach to the skill set. 
um, that uh, the people who are doing the work of, of prevention um, should have. And you're gonna see these pieces kind of come together around those other models that we've talked about. And that is um, uh, that there's eight um, professional uh, competencies. Um, this was um, recently um, authored and planned by uh, David Anderson with the help of a group of us um, and funded by the PTTC. Um, and this really is um, the, the type of uh, program where, or, or, or guide um, to help you expand the thinking um, to be comprehensive of what you need to know and what you also need to share with others. Um, so when we were talking about, for instance, policy level changes, that may surprise people in your campus community that the AOD uh, prevention person should be thinking about policy, maybe even policies not just on um, the campus, but maybe with their um, system or maybe within their community. Um, and so understanding those skill sets and having supervisors understand the um, skill sets is really important. Um, one of the um, things, and you'll see my name is in this list, um, and I'm really proud of, <laughs> tongue in cheek a bit, uh, but um, I, I really push for the, the title of this particular document is um, The Eight. Uh, professional core competencies. And that the, I think, is really important, not because it's true um, that there are only, that it's a definite, the eight, um, but it's important, I think, for those administrators, those around who aren't, who may be not as uh, familiar with the work that we have to do, having them understand that there are many competencies that you need to have. And, and, and I think it, it, it's intriguing to say there are eight. Uh, because people might want to test whether or not they um, have all eight. Um, so just know that, um, so again, this is comprehensive in, in the sense that it's comprehensive in um, what we thought of uh, in the process. And we could probably, um, over time, find other uh, competencies that are very important. Um, some folks uh, kind of go to, when you think about competencies, um, there are uh, uh, states that really encourage uh, certified prevention specialists. Um, and that is um, something that um, you, you see a lot in community prevention uh, work. And, um, and one of the questions early on was, well, those are, there are those eight competencies. Um, why not just do these? And, and really, it's because campuses are different. And we're going to dive into some of those differences and the expertise that you need to do the prevention on a college campus, perhaps that is different, not necessarily entirely alien, but different um, than a community uh, prevention uh, professional. So going back to um, some of these uh, competencies, uh, the first one on the top of this particular um, uh, matrix is a... Um, a competency around prevention science. And prevention science is um, not just uh, measurement, um, but it really emphasizes that you can uh, look at the problem in a scientific manner. Um, un you, can, you can categorize it, you can measure it, and then you can use scientific methods to test whether or not um, changes that you make, uh, interventions that you have, um, demonstrate changes in those measures that you have used um, and then report out and actually go through the scientific method. And that's been done. It actually is a very rich um, research um, uh, literature around, uh, especially around college uh, binge drinking. Um, and, and if you're doing a search, a lot of times that binge is uh, an important component to looking for some of those articles. Not always, but um, binge was really widely used um, during some of the formative research that was happening. And um, I wanted to share some of the um, resources 
that you can find um, pretty easily um, that can guide you towards evidence-based researched approaches and understand that these research approaches really do um, usually uh, do what they say. You'll, you'll get the results that you want, at least you know improvement, if you start with those that have been demonstrated to be effective, um, but you need to still match it to those other comprehensive, are these um, indicated uh, students? Are they universal? Um, are there ways of taking some of these programs and make them universal? These are all some of the questions that we have with some of the research. But this particular document that you're seeing here, the College AIM, is a, a vetted matrix by the NIAAA, one of the NIHs that does focus on um, alcohol and alcohol uh, abuse. And, um, and this particular matrix helps you find what has been demonstrated to be effective. And it actually helps you also look at what the costs are. So you can choose uh, in this matrix uh, a low cost but effective program. That seems like a good place to start if you have to start somewhere. Some programs are more expensive, uh, either in terms of effort or in actual dollars. Um, and some, uh, unfortunately, have shown not to be all that effective. And in fact, there are some that just say, do not do these particular programs. They've been tried over and over again, and they are not uh, going to get the results that you want to see. And so having this competency, knowing that there is a research um, uh, literature on especially again alcohol, but there is some growing research on what to do around uh, cannabis and some other drugs. Um, these are components of an effective um, program that you'd be doing on your campus. Uh, do not start by just making things up because you should understand that the science is there. Um, it isn't complete uh, and also suffers from a lack of um, uh, uh, humility around diversity, um, so a lot of the a lot of the studies don't um, demonstrate or haven't been demonstrated to be um, just cookie cutter. Put it in any community that that may not be the case. So there's still a lot of work to do, uh, and. We've already talked about some of that within like strategic planning. If you're picking something, are you confident that you can do it within with minimal changes or are you going to need to break some new ground so that you can meet the needs of your students? Competency two is around alcohol and other drug knowledge. Um, this is probably some of the easiest thing to understand. Um, you should know something about the alcohol and drugs um, that your students are using. Now, this is not necessarily a static component. There are, um, there's always research coming out about some of the impacts of certain substances. And then there are also new substances coming around. And that sounds odd, but I think a lot of people now have understood um, what we're talking about, where there could be new, um, as cannabis products have changed dramatically over the last 20 years, um, from maybe a few concentrates and, um, and different strains of uh, leaf product, to now really highly processed and some uh, manufactured THC derivatives um, that we really are learning as we go on the impact of some of these um, drugs. Um, one of the things that I learned early on a long time ago um, was in, in surveys, a lot of times we um, have a question of other uh, when you have a list of uh, substances. Um, and sometimes these are, if you have a survey that's gone to a lot of people, it can be really cumbersome to actually look at those text fields that people um, put in when they say, I have used this, this, and this because it wasn't on the list that I provided. Well, I finally did that once <laughs> where I looked at them all um, because someone uh, prompted me uh, saying, have you ever heard of salvia? And I hadn't. Um, and uh, I, then I looked 
and I found that students were using salvia divinorum. I hadn't heard of that before, but it was in our data all along. Um, and that required a whole lot of better understanding uh, on my part to, um, to see what does it mean for them to be using this particular substance. Um, so, uh, so certainly uh, make sure that you've spent some time understanding the larger uh, or more prevalent of the alcohol, of drugs, alcohol um, being number one, cannabis almost always two, and then a big gap between other types of substances. Um, and then also keep your eyes open to the changes. Talked about um, strategic planning uh, and already spent some of that time where I showed you that flower. Um, but this is the actual document that you could look at to go through um, that strategic planning. And it should be part of your competencies to understand the basic components of strategic planning. Whether this can be a workbook that you and perhaps your alcohol and other drug um, task force or committee or whatever it is um, works with, um, or if you just are mindful of the need for those steps in strategic planning. Um, all of that um, can be found within this document and, um, and the campus professional uh, is better off if they know that these resources are available. So I strongly encourage you to um, download this uh, from um, the site that is, is listed here and, um, and then be familiar and share it with those in your, um, in, uh, in your task force or those you're working with. Um, needs assessment, evaluation, research. Um, so talked about uh, prevention science. Um, a component of that, of course, is going to be measurement. Um, and, but understanding measurement and understanding where you can find um, uh, the measures is also really important. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of show you a few of the places you could find data. One of the more commonly um, uh, turned to place is the ACHA, NCHA, the National Collegiate Health Assessment. Uh, your campus may or may not be um, using it, but if they are using it, then that means you have a very rich, um, kind of overly rich um, set of items uh, around different substances um, and their use on your campus, which can be very helpful if you need to understand. I, you know, I mentioned alcohol and then cannabis and then a big gap in other. Well, what are those other um, drugs? What are, and then you can also be looking for um, uh, different populations might be um, using different substances in different ways. And so you can do some of those um, analyses through um, the um, NCHA. Monitoring the future is a very good resource. It isn't something you could do on your campus, but knowing that it exists um, can help provide a lot of understanding of um, what, um, what's going on. Um, I do want to kind of give a little nod to the Wellbeing Improvement Survey for Higher Education Settings or WISHES. Um, you can find that. Um, actually, they updated their website, but it still works. The uh, new dot, um, NYU.edu. It's a, it's a very short survey and it does have a couple items uh, around binge drinking, but it is a simple survey um, that campuses can use um, after signing a use agreement. Uh, it is free, um, but it's really helpful for getting some um, quick feedback. The whole point of it is um, about that improvement. Um, and then of course you can also create your own um, and this could be part of that assessment. That evaluation and research means that, you know, how do you do a survey? Is that the type of skill set that you have? You may need to learn some of that skill set because a lot of times you need to create items uh, and deploy surveys um, in this field because you need that information to understand what is going on amongst the students. Now, that could be survey, survey. It could also be focus groups. It could be other ways of um, more systematically getting information than anecdotally. Anecdotes can really help you start the process, but a lot of times you need to be careful because we know that, for instance, um, students um, report that they think a lot of students are doing other things. They themselves aren't doing it, but everyone else is. 
that sort of um, bias in their perception. Um, but that could, but that could reflect back to us. Um, well, they hear that everyone is doing at this uh, substance, um, but it turns out it's actually really, really um, small number of students. And so, um, being systematic, understanding how to do that, is part of the work of the um, AOD uh, specialists on campus, so that they have that competency about what is um, going on. And and then if you are developing measures, um, it's really important to remember or you're deploying measures exactly why you're doing it. And, and there's three basic reasons to do um, measurement. Uh, a lot of times um, people are doing it really more for, in this particular um, chart, like they call it accountability. Uh, or you could call it benchmarking. Um, so NCHA is really good for that. You can get the level. You now know what it is. Um, that may help you um, in terms of showing that it's a priority, that we should do something about it. Um, sometimes people like to uh, compare uh, against a national um, mean or average um, and then see if their campus is above or below it. That's that benchmarking idea. Um, are you above it or are you below it? That doesn't necessarily mean that if you're below it, you don't want to actually continue and create an environment that has even less of a problem. Um, so it's not actually informative in that regard, but it can help you understand if you um, need to prioritize things in different ways. Um, and that's really important for strategic uh, planning. Sometimes people do the, the um, surveys or the measurement for research. Um, for instance, they're curious about um, some of the mechanisms, some of the underlying reasons people might be using um, or misusing substances. And that is very helpful. It helps generate new knowledge. Um, it, it really can also help you uh, away from some of those biases that um, we've been talking about a little bit on uh, those social norms, what people think others are doing versus the actually doing, um, but also some of the diversity issues, uh, whether or not you have a, um, accounted for uh, differential um, outcomes um, and, and that you understand those. And, um, and so that research is very important, but it doesn't necessarily feed into that strategic planning there's the strategic planning um, requires that you understand where you are and then see whether or not you've moved where you are through the process of your program. And in that regard, you're really talking about improvement. And improvement is um, a different style of measurement. And I talked about a little bit about that well being improvement survey for higher education settings. A lot of campuses that are starting to use this actually deploy it very often, for instance, every month. Um, that's something we do at um, San Diego State University here. Um, so that we get more immediate feedback on what is going on. We can look for trends much more easily um, than maybe in every other year or every three year. Uh, deployment of a larger survey. Um, so something nimble can give you feedback and that's important for your strategic planning. And then you're really doing something and that strategic planning was a flower and there's, you can think of it in other ways. These um, just, this is just a little simpler version of a plan, do, study, act. Um, and it is telling you to, uh, you develop it, you then um, try it you have to measure, and then you need to make changes to your next iteration so that you're continuously improving. This is the type of measurement that I think actually we tend to ignore, but we really need to be using much more of continuous measures so that you can continuously identify whether or not the things you're doing are improvements and meeting the needs. And so you do it, but you don't just do it once. You do it over and over and over and over again. And hopefully in this very simple version, you're always going up. Now you're going to find something, some things don't work. Um, that's part, that's why we do evalu uh, evaluation and research. If we always did something effective, we wouldn't need 
to get that feedback because we would just assume that it works. Unfortunately, a lot of people move in that direction, even though they haven't demonstrated that it is an accurate um, approach. So um, just think about your measurement and think about whether or not it is fitting the needs for a continuously improving process of doing the work of alcohol and other drug prevention. And actually, this particular model doesn't require it to be for AOD work, but it certainly should be. Um, another skill set, program management. Obviously, when you're doing these things, you need to actually manage them and make sure they happen. Make sure that um, uh, they happen the way you thought they would. Is it being implemented? Do you have the right people? Um, we talked about some of those capacity components in that strategic planning. Um, these are the skills in, in order to successfully do that. Um, and so understanding that, um, how to integrate in um, uh, the, the practices to new information, um, supervising folks. It could be supervising other professionals, but a lot of campuses, you're supervising students um, and thinking about uh, the training of the students and um, are, they, are they trained and ready to do the programs um, that are necessary at the time in the academic year? So for instance, we have um, an understanding that the first several weeks of a, um, a fall semester or quarter are some of the riskiest times around alcohol and other drugs. Um, but if you are just starting to recruit and train your students during that time, um, you're not necessarily managing your workforce in an appropriate way. You would want to have people ready um, on day one to do whatever work you think is necessary during that highest risk element um, if that's the approach you're going to take. So this sort of programmatic management, that's part of the strategic management. Do we have the capacity and can we manage and train and supervise the, the workforce um, to do the work at the time necessary to uh, affect the change that you're trying to do? Um, similarly, just like uh, we are talking about with management, you know, um, Understanding the, the policy level uh, may surprise um, some folks when we're talking about the competencies, but it's really important. Um, start with, um, if you are doing the work of alcohol and other drug um, prevention and, and or intervention or recovery support, um, you may be involved in a compliance with some of the laws. Uh, for instance, Drug-Free Schools and Community Act um, requires campuses to do um, certain types of things around alcohol and other drugs. So those components are really important um, to understand what are the laws and then and what are the policies on campus and how do they facilitate what it is you want to accomplish and how do you um, improve them if you think you can do that work. Um, and again, we go back to that um, continuum of care. Um, these are the strategies that really uh, help with those universal um, components. What can you do to the entire um, environment through policies and other environmental strategies um, that impact everyone? Um, and that means that you don't have to target, you aren't targeting necessarily, um, and you can actually often get some of the larger effects of um, your work through those elements because they impact the entire community. Um, so it may impact a smaller percentage of the community, but a community can be big and that can mean a lot of good taken from uh, an action that addresses the entire community. So. That's important and it's really some of them, and you go back to that um, evidence of, of improvement, of change. This particular um, screenshot is around that college aim and it speaks to the need for environmental level strategies because they, they've been really well researched um, to show uh, improvement. 
And then uh, another competency, and this is all kind of, there's some overlapping components of it um, that we've been talking about, but this leadership, um, that's part of the management. It's part of um, making sure that uh, you're also managing up in a sense, making sure that um, administrators understand the work that is, needs to be done, um, making the changes to the community, uh, working with others, um, to affect some of the universal levels of prevention. These are part of the skill set that um, are important for the work that you're doing. It is very difficult to, um, to do on a lot of campuses because, uh, you know, there's the president, vice president, maybe an AVP, maybe a, a director of a student health services, or maybe a counseling psychological services. And then there's a, maybe an assistant director. And then, you know, the person who's doing the alcohol and drug prevention work, maybe six levels down from the, the campus president. That's a hard place to be a, a leader for, but it, but it does take that, making sure that your voice is heard, that uh, for, uh, for instance, sitting in your office waiting for someone, um, is going to help that someone come in who's coming in, but it is not going to do a lot of what prevention really is about because it takes a wider lens. Um, and that leadership is really important. You can also think of it even beyond your community, but all the way up to your state and national level. This particular um, image is um, the states, the darker uh, green, are states that have a recognized um, coalition of, of campuses in their state and a leader who has joined um, our particular consortium. Excuse me. And with that, you know, understand that there's layers. So if you need help and you are in um, either a, a um, a state system or some other system of campuses, or if you are in part of a, a state, a state that has a coalition, you could be um, either a leader in that, but understand that there's other leaders who are um, helping move the needle in different ways, but also move the information in different ways. Our center tries to move some of that information um, to the campus professionals. And that's, um, that's, a lot of people take that task on to share and to learn from each other. And that's part of leadership. And so if, um, both doing it for others and then being ready and, and networked enough to do it, uh, uh, to benefit from it yourself. Um, and then that's where things get um, uh, really helpful to have that leadership and have the, have the understanding of those um, uh, around you, um, that you may be doing a lot of communication and a lot of advocacy um, and doing it well. That's important. That's the competency. Um, understanding when you can and how you can um, do that advocacy for the work that you are doing. Um, that's how you accomplish um, many of the things that we've just talked about. So these are the... Um, the types of things that you'll need to think of if you want to think expansively, comprehensively of the work that you need to do. It is a big job and it often isn't understood by those who are hiring the person um, to do the job that it really takes this level um, to expect on a campus level that you're going to see some change. So I want to share a little bit uh, uh, places that you can explore um, for more um, uh, education on these different components. Uh, if you found some that you think you've got um, in the bag, but you want to do um, some improvement on your own skill set on some of these others, um, here's some places you could look. I've mentioned uh, pretty much all of them um, through uh, this particular presentation. Um, but you, of course, our center, um, the, um, the blog posts of, uh, that the DEA has been putting, the campus, um, drugprevention.gov, 
has quite a number of places so you can um, get some education on many of these topics. Of course, NASPA and um, American College Health Association, ACHA, um, also uh, are great places to turn. Um, I, we've talked about the College AIM. If you haven't looked at it yet, that's a place I really encourage you to go to and start looking these over. And um, uh, an example of one of those state coalitions, the Missouri Partners, um, that uh, in prevention um, has some great um, resources that I encourage you to check out. Um, and then I mentioned the Wishes um, survey. It comes out of the Action Network for Equitable, Equitable Wellbeing. Um, and, um, and you can learn more about that process. A little broader topic than, um, than just AOD, but if you are also doing some of this other work and you can also get transferable skills um, from the, the um, work that they are doing as well. And with that, I'm gonna hand it back to, uh, to Anthony, if I can do this right, there we go. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Lang, for uh, this informative session. I do just have a couple of sessions. Again, uh, if you have any questions for uh, Dr. Lang, feel free to submit them at this time. Of course, uh, you can connect with us virtually as well. On the screen uh, is our uh, email address that you can connect to, and this QR code will directly take you to our website. So a lot of those resources uh, that Dr. Lang mentioned are on our website as well. Um, additionally, here are just a reminder that we do have just a couple of upcoming events. We have a water cooler chat taking place next week on the 13th, and we'll be focused on opioid, opioid overdose on campus. And we also have a recovery-focused webinar taking place later in September on September 26th, and it's titled Ethics in the Collegiate Recovery Professional. I don't see any questions coming in, but I do just want to put up our contact slide uh, just again, so feel free to reach out to us. Uh, with any questions. Just a friendly reminder that today's session has been recorded and you can expect to see it uploaded to our website within three business days. Thank you again, Dr. Lang, and thank you everybody for joining us. Take care all.